Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. We're live on YouTube. Hope everyone is doing well today. Just give me a moment. And I will get the status update on the screen. Thanks everyone for joining us, wherever you're joining us from. Happy Tuesday. My name is Meta Parlakar. I'm gonna give the status, engineering status update on Casper Labs. We'll talk about where we are and then we'll talk about a community driven topic. One is identity. Um, I have uh, some interesting thoughts around what needs to happen for real self-sovereign identity and we're gonna be doing some prototyping of an interesting um, solution. So let's just dive in with that. Uh, engineering status. So we have entered our second sprint of the 20.07 release cycle, sprint 3.2. We will be releasing node 0 0.20 this week. And we're gonna test it in LRT for seven days before we uh, inform the testnet validators of the new release. In this release, we have uh, contract headers and contract headers are basically uh, a feature that enable you to specify endpoint entry points into your smart contract. Um, they work very similarly to header files in software engineering. If you know you write a C file and you have a .h file, uh, contract headers operate very similarly. Do we know, Ashok, if there will be a separate file type in the smart contracts that will be a dot H, is it going to have that same model? Do you know that or is it something different? No, I, I don't know that, um, but we do have like an introduction to um, contract headers uploaded in our um, workshops. Okay. So, uh, you know, people can just go go there and check it out. We have we already given that workshop. Yeah, so there's a YouTube video on it. Um, we'll see yeah. about, um, I'm gonna be going through that this weekend. We gotta distill it down into some documentation because who watches videos really? Um, but I, my expectation is that the DAP developer guide probably sometime next week will be updated with how to use contract headers. Yep. Um, we have that scheduled. I think Mache is gonna update that. So we'll get the documentation done as well. That's right. Awesome. And uh, current focus. So for those of you not aware, we have kicked off a private repo. We are doing some work in Rust. Uh, there's Casper Labs dash node. It's still private, but we will be updating this and making it public at some point in the future when it's ready. But basically what we're doing is building a node with the exact, you know, very similar semantics, not the same, but basically the same features as Scala, um, but in, a, in Rust. And this will be the primary uh, piece of software you'll use to deploy the Casper Labs network. The uh, Scala code, which you currently see here, uh, this will be deprecated in favor of the Rust, of the pure Rust implementation. Uh, so yeah, so testnet uh, is looking good. And it's been 30 days since we bounced testnet last time. Highway's been stable. Um, we introduced uh, deploy gossiping in Omega Blocks. I wrote a blog post on Omega Blocks. Um, the network's running uh, with a slower finality. So blocks get proposed about every 20 seconds, but final finalization takes about eight minutes with the current configuration. We plan on increasing the size of the test net to 50 nodes during the next restart. Um, that will happen with the software 0 0.20 version that we're releasing this week. We're gonna test it for a few weeks. We're going to get our documentation updated. We're gonna do some performance testing in LRT and then it's our intention to, re to start the beta timeframe on July 15th with that software. We have no real open bugs, right? The remaining no. two, we don't know that they're really critical, right? That need to they be They are not critical and we may choose not to uh, take them on. That's right, okay. 
Yep. So working on the node rust piece, um, we're moving, uh, porting the contract runtime into the new rust container and we're implementing the era supervisor and the highway synchronizer. What does the synchronizer do Ashok? Uh, that's to uh, have all the nodes and the consensus um, uh, come to the same state. So synchronize, uh, synchronize their state basically. Oh, it's consensus basically. Okay. Yeah, that one is consensus. Okay. When you say consensus, so then to call it a highway synchronizer is a different, different thing for me. Okay. I always thought it was consensus. Um, let's see, merging of contract headers, multi-signature algorithm support. So for those, those of you that don't know, we support Ethereum keys now. Um, we're very happy to do this. Uh, we got a feature request from one of our customers that we're doing a proof of concept with that we support Ethereum keys. So the team has implemented that. There's a good amount of work to go into Clarity and our clients to support multiple signature algorithms, but that's been done. Uh, what is this DNS for code piece that we're doing? So uh, I think this is a proof of concept that we are doing basically to manages, manage DNS records across multiple providers. Um, just testing it out if, whether we, uh, we benefit by taking this up. But what does it do? Like what's it the basically benefit? basically manages DNS records across multiple providers. That's what it is. But why would we want to do that? What does it give us? I think it's uh, it's becoming difficult to manage the LRTs the way they are right now. So this probably helps um, in in uh, reducing the like the management overhead and you know um, provisioning overhead. I see. So AWS doesn't provide you any tools with that to do that. I think that I think this is a better tool, maybe. Okay, can you go find out for sure what it's for, what the benefit is? Yeah, I read through the the tickets basically, um, but yeah. It, it or just send me the tickets and I'll read through them because I like to actually yeah. push and understand yeah, what yeah, we're yeah. spending our time and energy on. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, S test. We're supporting contract headers, multi sig algorithm, and wasmless transfer. One of the things, Ashok, I'd like to also be able to do is turn S tests over to um, the, the validators. I know right now S tests requires its own internal faucet. It would be great if there was a way for uh, S test to specify what is the fully funded account or something like that that it uses um, to run its performance test. So we could run right. it in testnet. I think it has a dep hard dependency on an internal faucet. So I chatted about this with um, with the developers. Um, the what's the use case that we are targeting here? So basically, when if it is just testing like the test net in terms of number of deployments, S test could be a much heavier tool for that. Uh, we could just do like a small script to. No, 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 we don't want to do that. We want to give the validators S tests so they can point S tests at their own node and use the workload generators to send workload. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to do. Okay. So it feels like what it should do is uh, potentially um, you know, what Tom would need to do is give each of the validators like a root account that was funded with a lot of token. And mm -hmm. then they would just drop that account in into S test as a configuration to use as quote unquote the faucet. And then they could run the token transfers, create a bunch of accounts, run the, you know, basically run token transfers using the, using the account list that they create. The workload generator will work done. Right. We don't want to use a small script to test test net. That's not going to really work. That's that's not the level of testing we want, right? Like if we're if we're going to scale, this network's going to scale the way we think it's going to scale. Then what we need to do is let each of the validators load up their nodes and see how this thing performs. We until we've done that, we've not really tested this thing. So let me know and, and feel free to schedule a meeting if you get pushback from them on it. If they if they need to understand my vision for this. Right.
And the testnet validators want to do this, right? Like they mm -hmm. want to understand how the node performs under tremendous load. So right. we got to load it up. I mean, this is, this is the way Google does it. This is how we need to do it. Okay. Um, yeah, the work that S-Test is doing is great. It's contract headers, multi-sig algorithm, and wasm-less transfer. I don't know if we need the multi-sig algorithm support unless we expect that the multi-signatures are more computationally expensive in some way, but okay. Uh, ecosystem, we're working on a smart the support contract. Is required, the support is required because the way um, uh, the internal mechanics is changing because uh, to support the multiple signatures. So it's uh, kind yes, of yes, 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 yes. That's right. That's right. We're not making an assumption that we're using that. So we're we're sending like the hash or something, right? Correct. Yes. Correct. Yep. We're using it. the count hash now. Yep. 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 Um, on the smart contract DSL for ecosystem, we're doing that for Rust and Assembly Script, or are we doing something that overlays over both? Mm -hmm. I thought we. Um, I thought we were going to turn the ship so we could do the proof of concept with Solang. This is for Rust as of now, as okay. far as I remember. Yeah, this is for Rust. Okay, so we're just doing a DSL for Rust. Probably not a bad idea to get a small DSL out there and let people give us feedback on it. Mm -hmm. And then the proof of concept for Solang, I'm assuming this is Mache's highest priority. Correct. Mache has already made some kind of a progress on this. And we'll have, um, by end of this week, we'll have some good. Uh, proof of concept nice Absolutely. and, and uh, some inference drawn from it because there are two ways this can go uh, and we have to see which which uh, path works best for us yep sounds good for those of you that don't know what Solang is Solang is a solidity to Wasm compiler and we are planning on providing support for solidity we're doing a proof of concept right now to see what that would take in all probability, we would need to provide um, we would need to provide uh, ABI that would enable uh, access to the smart contracting features that Casper Labs has, right? So we have some pretty cool smart contracting features, and you would need to use a basically a Casper Labs library in your Solidity contracts if you were to use Solidity with Solang. But this is still very much a proof of concept. We're going to see what it's going to take to do this. Economics, we've got a lot of work we're going to tie off with economics um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, so uh, specifically, uh, we're going to update the economic simulator to include the new senior with, with Omega blocks. So we need to support Omega blocks with, for seniorage. And then we're starting some initial research on validator bonding auctions. And Uh, the token price volatility phenomenon, this is the stabilization of fees, Ashok, is that right? Yeah. So um, Anur has a, yeah. a market simulator and uh, he's, he's adding the, the price volatility um, on top of it. Got it, great. Uh, OG, you had a question? No, 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 that was an error. Okay, no problem. Okay, sounds good. Terrific, all right. So we, we're on track to cut the release on Thursday. We'll probably, week. Yeah, we'll probably target Thursday. Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, let's see, let's look at one thing here. I wanna talk about identity. I got a question about identity. So that was something that the community wanted to know about and what are my thoughts around identity and I can talk a little bit about um, a proof of concept we're going to start working on I hope I can find it where did it go one second guys sorry So we're working um, with a group. I have to, you know, keep this. Uh, I, I can't. I can't give a lot of details because I'm still under NDA. But we are talking, uh, talking about building um, and working with a group to build an identity solution that is self-sovereign, right? And so you hear a lot of talk about self-sovereign identity and 
you know, why is self-sovereign identity important? Well, obviously it's because you don't want people just taking your data, sharing your data, having your data, um, personally identifiable information, PII is what it's referred to, right? And if you talk to just about any corporation out there, they have a lot of concerns about even holding on to this data. It's a huge liability for them, right? Um, they have to spend a lot of money on security infrastructure and uh, security protocols, and you know, chief security officer to make sure they can keep this data secure, right? And think of any institution like a lending institution, a financial institution, or even your healthcare provider, right? If they have your name, address, home phone number, social security number, date of birth, um, that information can be used obviously in identity theft, right? And you hear a lot of stories around how, uh, you know, these, these companies just cannot do a good job of securing this data, right? They're not information technology specialists. And if your data is going to be stolen by anybody from anywhere, it's going to be stolen from these places, right? So self-sovereign identity does two things. One, it removes the responsibility or the burden of holding on to this personally identifiable information on individual corporate systems. So that's the first important thing it does. The second thing it does is it requires... Uh, well, it does three things. It requires the user to give explicit permission uh, to share that information, right? It can't be implicitly shared. And when I talk about implicitly being shared, it's, for example, like if I do business with Wells Fargo for my personal checking, Wells Fargo will then solicit me. You know, they will say that, well, because we've done business with you on your personal checking account, we're going to solicit you for loans, and we're going to solicit you for a credit card. Well, I may not necessarily want to be solicited for those things, right? But because they have the same top level entity, they believe that they can share my information. And then they have all of my information. Sometimes and many times they have a lot more information than they need to have, right? So there's no granularity with how much data I share. And so self-sovereign identity does solves all three of these problems, right? It, 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 uh, it, it's, it provides this capability to do this zero knowledge proof thing, right? Like you don't need to know where I live. You just need to know I'm 21. If you want to give me access to a bar, for example, right? Or if I'm applying for, you know, a credit card, you don't need all of this personal information about my, you know, financial status, where I work, how long I work there, et cetera, et cetera. All the information that's currently in the credit report, that is just way too much. You only need my credit score. You only need to know how credit worthy I am and whether or not I have a job, right? And can I pay if I if I have a credit limit of, you know, X and this is the maximum minimum payment, will my salary cover that, right? Is that is that less than 15% of my salary, right? Take home salary as an example. It's all the information they need. They don't need to have everything else, right? In order to make that a good solid decision. And so self-sovereign identity really helps with this, right? And there's, there's a couple of things you need to think about too. Like when you think about any of the, you've got this fabulous trust layer you're building with blockchain and that's great. Blockchain gives you a lot of trust, but if you don't have any trust about who you're doing business with, AAA, K, there's no identity, then do you really have a trusted layer? If it's possible for you to create um, many, many unknown identities on the blockchain, what is the implications to the trust layer of the blockchain itself? Right. And so there needs to be, uh, we need to strike a balance here. We obviously don't want all of our personal information smeared on a public blockchain that does not take us in the right direction. So one, it's very clear that the personal and identifiable information needs to be encrypted. So that's a very obvious requirement. It needs to be encrypted, needs to be secure. Number two, the only person that has access to that personally identifiable information is the holder of that information. So if it's my information, it's me. I'm the only person that has access to it. And I can secure that using private key cryptography. It also becomes really clear really easily that this good old problem of the user experience of managing keys seamlessly and easily and being able to recover them is also an issue, right? So you need to have really, really good key management and you need to have a recovery story. You need to be able to recover um, access uh, to my personally identifiable information since something goes sideways. You also need to have something around entities, right? So entities, um, entities are also considered individuals. So you would probably need something there. So at a minimum, you're gonna need um, these pieces, right? In order to come up with an, uh, a self-sovereign 
identity solution, right? What do you think about identity? So there's a lot of companies in this space that are doing some good work around this, like Shift has, uh, is one of our partners and we plan on doing an integration with Shift where we can provide FATF uh, regulated identity. Um, basically you go through the KYC process with an FATF provider and then you create an identity on the Shift network. And then you can use that identity to transact um, on other chains, right? Shift has done many integrations in many other blockchains, and we intend on providing an easy API for people to leverage Shift's um, identity system, right? And so this this is a great way for you know DApp developers to plug into identity solution. There's other identity solutions that I've seen that uh, keep basically all of your private information on your cell phone, and then people that can, can va validate that you're a real person, the GPG signing, GPG key signing, right? Something very similar to that. So if you meet somebody and you know that they're a real person, you can say, hey, let 30 features for the user where the user has control over who gets access to it, um, number one. And number two, uh, they need to make, you know, public key cryptography really, really easy. It's just got to be really easy to uh manage you know manage your identity and recover your identity in the event you lose your phone or you know and it prevents theft right so it should be easy to steal it i love the work that secure enclave you know apple has done i'm a big apple fan for those of you that know secure enclave and the biometrics within the phone are fantastic i think recovering your keys even with google authenticator anybody's had to recover their google authenticator keys that is no fun um, so I think that there's an opportunity to do better in the space. I don't know that Apple has actually figured out how to, you know, migrate your keys from one storage device to another. I think once they figure that out and it's easy, we'll be in a, in a much better place to use our phones as a primary device, right? To one, recover the keys and two, to transfer them to a new device. So that's my little spiel on identity and how I, you know, how I've been thinking about it. I think it's super important. I believe that Casper Labs will need to provide a very easy way to uh, get access to self-sovereign identity solutions and expose those to DAP developers, right? So DAP developers are not there scratching their head, figuring out what kind of identity solution they want to use, right? So that's my two cents on it. Economist, did you have content to, play, uh, to share today? Um, I don't know if we talked about any specific economic content for today. Uh, well, actually, uh, in your uh, in your list of things to talk about, you did have uh, storage and auctions. So uh, I took it upon myself to do a little storage uh, thing. Cool. All right. So let me let me just share my screen here. Okay. Let's see. Okay. There we go. All right. Uh, is it uh, is it visible? Do you see it full screen? Yep. Yep. Okay, excellent. That's great. Yeah. All right. So, well, we're going to talk about uh, paid for storage today. And uh, the first uh, thing to discuss is why do we actually, you know, need to have anyone pay for storage? Or rather, more generally, why do we need to make storage costly, right? Because in this case, it's not necessarily that uh, someone would pay someone, but, uh, you know, some tokens would be taken away in some uh, form or another. So from a distributed systems perspective, uh, you know, we must price all scarce resources. Uh, this is true for uh, storage. Uh, this is true for, uh, you know, CPU cycles. Uh, you know, eventually it's going to be uh, true of bandwidth. Uh, I mean, this principle is generally quite well understood, I think, uh, in the uh, blockchain space, right? I mean, anything, anything, anywhere where you can uh, make the system do work uh, for free is basically an attack surface. And uh, assigning uh, some form of cost to it uh, is, uh, of course, how you prevent the attack. Now, from an economic perspective, there is there's uh, another uh, angle which is, you know, sort of orthogonal to the previous one, uh, which is that the pricing of these resources is necessary to make sure that they're allocated efficiently, right? So if you don't want a situation where it's essentially, you know, you're pricing some resources, so you assign a fixed price, you know, that is basically, you know, if it becomes really, really scarce, it becomes a lottery, uh, you know, as to who gets it, right? I mean, ideally, you know, we would prefer to have a situation uh, where people who derive the most value from it uh, get it. 
And so, uh, of course, this leaves the major question of how do you actually assign, uh, you know, these costs or these prices to storage. And so we'll talk about uh, basically ways for users uh, to uh, part with their money, uh, allocation of uh, storage, uh, and uh, whether it should be rented or bought. So first of all, well, how do we actually take the tokens of the exchange for this, right? So there are three ways, more or less, that the tokens can be moved around uh, uh, to make this costly. Uh, one of them is just uh, to burn the tokens. Uh, the other one is to, of course, pay the token, and the final one is to hold the tokens as a deposit. All right. So uh, burning the tokens, uh, of course, takes the reverse to a lot of circulation. Uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about, uh, you know, any incentive issues you might create by, you know, coming up with some, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> ill-conceived uh, distribution system. Uh, but uh, it has a downside in that it adds, uh, you know, a lot of complexity, I think, to the, you know, macroeconomic uh, model of the platform, because now you could have a situation where uh, you can, you know, enter some kind of a deflationary phase because uh, there is a high demand for, uh, you know, high demand for storage. And uh, what that does to the platform is completely unclear, and uh, it's also unclear how to forecast something like this. And of course, there's an issue of well, what happens if you freeze a storage, right? I mean, you know, that, that possibly, you know, it's uh, of course you want to somehow incentivize that so that uh, you know you don't fill up your uh, platform with garbage. But unfortunately, if you already burn the token, it's not clear where you're going to get the tokens to reimburse uh, for, you know. Uh, freeing up the storage. So, I mean, of course, one could uh, conceivably come up with some additional mechanism to do this, but, you know, it just uh, the problem here is that you start with a simple solution of burning the tokens, and then, you know, suddenly you have to, you know, design something on top of it uh, to make sure that you incentivize and, uh, you know, removal of uh, uh, useless data. Uh, now, uh, in the case of uh, just paying the tokens, right, so this is you know, sort of uh, the most natural way, in a sense. Uh, tokens are transferred to the platform. Uh, you know, of course, uh, transfer to the platform means it's, uh, you know, somebody on the other end gets it, and that somebody is probably a validator. Uh, and uh, this requires analysis of incentives we are creating with any potential allocation scheme, right? I mean, is it, uh, you know, it, is it shared? Is it the person who processes, uh, you know, the block where this uh, data is, uh, you know, the storage is allocated? You know, it's uh, it's going to be basically a potentially rather complex mechanism. And again, you have the issue of uh, what happens if the storage is freed. Who pays? Uh, you know, who pays the user back for that? Uh, again, would probably require some kind of an even more complicated, elaborate scheme. Uh, so finally, you know, there is deposit in the tokens, uh, and basically all that means is that holding a certain amount of tokens in your account guarantees you some amount of storage. So uh, this is actually, I think, a fairly elegant solution in a sense that it doesn't seem to really, uh, you know, screw with the macroeconomics of the platform. And additionally, it uh, solves the problem of free storage, because what happens is that, well, if you free storage, now you're free to, you know, use the tokens that were locked up, right? So it's a very simple, very elegant system. Now, so then the you know the you know follow up question is well how do we actually uh, allocate uh, the storage right so and the, the, the nodes that you know like for for all of these allocation mechanisms right I mean uh, you know they apply to potentially multiple ways you know for users to part with their money right because uh, you know for example. Uh, if you run an auction, the tokens that are collected may be burnt or they may be paid out, right? Similar for, you know, fixed price. The most uh, economically natural one is arguably, you know, auctions. But uh, here uh, it is actually, uh, you know, the, the benefit, of course, that it simply lets, uh, you know, the market discover what are the most value uh, per byte. Right, so you can have just a fixed price, uh, which would require some kind of a governance process. Uh, this is similar to, you know, sort of our original plan for gas that you're moving away from. Uh, so, well, you know, it's very simple. You know, it's probably suboptimal. Uh, so, you know, 
probably a uh, you know nicer compromise solution is just a float in price right i mean so you know we start with some fixed price we uh, have a mechanism that auto adjusts essentially based on demand uh, and it's a completely automated system that you know displays a single number to the user uh, you know so it's uh, arguably you know a nice compromise between you know a fixed a fixed price system and an auction system and uh, you know finally you know there's the issue of uh, you know sort of the the absolute numbers assigned to you know actually pay, being paid out right I mean, so basically should the storage be bought up front or should it be rented uh, so this uh, seems mostly a distinction for schemes that involve uh, burning tokens or transferring them, uh, not holding them as a deposit. Uh, but uh, of course, if the price of one-time payment would be naturally quite higher than per period rents, right? Because you're effectively paying, you know, to hold it forever, uh, at least until you know you free it and uh, you know get reimbursed somehow. Uh, so it's in principle should be possible to sort of uh, estimate, you know, you know, economically efficient one-time payments based on, you know, some assumptions regarding the evolution of the platform and, uh, you know, uh, you know, evolution of supply and demand and, you know, basically our, you know, interest rates, right? So I mean, it should, so it should be possible to make that calculation. Uh, and additionally, of course, paying up front is a much better user experience than having to, you know, bother with, you know, such regular rent, rent payments, uh, even if, of course, you know, they're partially automated. Uh, but uh, the thing is that, uh, you know, one might have to effectively underprice storage, uh, you know, relative to some stylized model because of uh, the liquidity constraints of, uh, you know, potentially valuable users, right? I mean, you want people to come to your platform and build, but these people don't have many tokens to start, right? So you want to essentially subsidize and put in something on your platform. So, uh, you know, let, let's say this, uh, you know, hypothetical uh, upfront, uh, you know, discounted uh, price that we calculated with our interest rates or whatever, that would uh, have to be lowered effectively to enable this. Uh, but so, uh, well, th this is kind of the state of our thinking right now about, uh, you know, this matter, of course, it's still very fuzzy, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to come back in the future with something more detailed. Uh, but that is it for now. Yeah, some of the things I've been thinking about, too, is like, if I have an application that uses, you know, global state storage, right, I'm storing data on the blockchain and... I may be doing things like adding new accounts or um, adding delegated keys where the, the state, the internal state of my contract is growing, right? So how, how does a token, you know, a, a contract owner need to account for the additional storage requirements for their contract? And how do we notify them that, hey, you know, you need to, if we want them to lock up contract, lock up token, right, to, to cover storage, hey, you need to lock up so much token. And then if they don't have enough token, what portions do we garbage collect, right? Like I would have to assume we, we can only programmatically garbage collect it all. We wouldn't be able to garbage collect some subset of this. So it's not easy. <laughs> um, these things rarely ever are easy, right? Anything good is never easy. So not necessarily. Sometimes it's good and easy, but... Thank you for that. Um, that was very informative. Any questions from folks? Like I, can add, I can add a point. Go for it. Uh, the storage issue also, like whether or not a validator full nodes will keep all, all past blocks or they will keep on, uh, back until a previous checkpoint also makes a difference terms of like storage requirements mm -hmm. uh, yeah we all we, we right now are considering like our network architecture what a light node full node and archival node means for us and like when, when we when we make a decision for storage we decide for like we we made we can decide for all of these types of nodes and that has implications on on the network structure in the long term, whether people can afford to run a node or not. So yeah, That's it's, right. it's it's 
it's it's uh it's still in discussion among ourselves yep for sure definitely and we definitely do not want to make it easy for people to store binary data like photos and that sort it's the, the blockchain just really isn't meant for that right um yeah we definitely want to make sure they're incentivized to use something like ipfs or storage um, we'll probably yeah. do an integration with storage. I like the store what storage.io is doing a whole bunch. So we'll definitely, mm -hmm. you know, look at that as an option too. So it's easy for DAP developers, right? That's the idea to have those hooks built in so they don't have to worry about it. Great folks. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys on Telegram. Join our Telegram, join our Discord, join our community, um, our community calls if you can. And then our weekly workshops every Thursdays. Um, there's a link uh, on Telegram and Discord if you want to catch the workshops and join us. We'll be adding those to Meetup as well. Cheers. Have a great day. Bye.